Church. Uh, if you are new with us today, I wanted to just draw your attention to our welcome cards. And so our welcome cards, you can either uh, scan the QR code and fill it out, uh, or you can just fill it out and drop in the offering plate whenever it passes. Uh, we also have prayer opportunities on the back of these cards. So if you had a prayer request, fill it out, drop it in the, in the basket, and then um, we will pray over those uh, with our prayer ministry. Something to draw your attention to that we've done the last couple of weeks as well. Uh, we have a response opportunity that we've been doing with this tree. So if you did not get one out the door, uh, you get a uh, thanks, hope, prayer. Uh, just write something that you're hopeful about. Write something that you're thankful for because, you know, with prayer we should also be giving praise. Or something that is heavy on your heart or on the heart of somebody else that you would like to pray for them. And so at any point during this service, if you wanted to get up and just hang it on the tree... Uh, we would love to pray over that or spend some time at uh, our altar. couple quick announcements. <clears throat> Today, we are doing, so this is for students and parents. Um, we are doing a, uh, a parent meeting about our summer trip. Just looking at the viability, if it's going to be casual, if it's going to be something else. So I just want to share some thoughts and ideas with you guys. That is happening immediately after service. So if you are a student or a parent, uh, immediately following service, go to the restroom if you need to, head to the fellowship hall, and that's where we're going to have our meeting for that. We have our women's Bible study still going on through the book of Revelation, so hop in there. Uh, it's not too late to join. That is Wednesdays at 10 o'clock in our fellowship hall. Uh, our budget sheets, if you are over a budgeted area of a ministry here at French Broad, your budget sheets are due today. And uh, we have a trunk and treat coming up with some flyers in the back. Make sure you, uh, you get a flyer and you pass it to somebody who has uh, young kids. We have, I think I just counted, 13 trunks signed up to be decorated and for candy and for games. If you are interested in partnering with us and decorating a trunk, uh, we'd love to see it. Uh, at this event, we're going to have, uh, you know, bring your costumes, uh, bring your candy. We're doing hot cider, games, and then even door prizes. So it's going to be fun. That is this coming Wednesday, October 30th. And we are planning to have dinner, and dinner at this point is going to be a dish called To Be Determined. So we will be sending that out. It has already been determined, guys. Look at that. It is tacos. Okay, so tacos. Uh, it's going to be this Wednesday, immediately following by our trunk or treat. So uh, if you're interested in, in uh, volunteering at this, <coughs> if you could sign up at the door uh, posted outside of the, uh, the sanctuary doors. Whew. At this time, if you can stand up and greet those around, you'll be here for worship. <laughs> Tell me how you doing, sir. Yeah. 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 Gear up for that fishing trip. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Got to see you again. Good to see you too. Hi, hi, hi. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's so good to see you all this 
um, there was a wonderful concert last night to benefit our communities. And, you know, as we keep seeing more and more of the devastation and the, the impact on lives around us, I just want us to remember that um, God tells us, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So our God is able, and he has overcome, and our God is victorious. So let's rest in that today as we call upon the Spirit to empower us.
all of us have those stories. Help us not to forget those in the days to come or even in these days, but help us to give you glory where it is due. We pray, Father, for our neighbors as well as our nation. We pray for the great needs that are in our community and just down the road uh, a few miles uh, away from us. Father, there are many lives that have been turned upside down. God, you are known for turning things right to down, <coughs> for restoring, for rebuilding, for renewing, for replenishing. And so may we be your hands and feet in that effort, even as we have been already. Will you continue to send us help? Will you continue to pour out your hope in these days? As we see that, and as we know that, and we experience that in our neighborhoods, may the nation that is watching our area see the love of Christ exalted and lifted up high. And may those who are looking and watching and wondering and asking, how is that possible? Help us to say through Christ, all things are possible. For indeed, that's true. Through our voices and our hearts in these moments together, oh Father, as we lift names and needs to you, we do so with earnest expectation that you're a God who is able to meet our needs, even before we ask. So hear us, we pray. God for providing even before we ask in your precious name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Let's stand to be raised. Just in 
for reminding us of that amazing and wonderful truth that is ours. In this hour, I invite our children, those who would like to slip out with children's worship, you're welcome to slip out with Miss Kim at this time. Well, is that true? Is that true? Everything I need, the Lord will provide. Have you found that to be true recently? Yes. Everything that you need. I'd say everything you wanted that everything that you need, the Lord provided. You know, we've been able to see that in our community. Um, you know, I was down in Old Fort uh, this past week, and we passed on a few of our uh, extra supplies that had come into us, and uh, I dropped off a few things down there, and I met a young woman, um, and uh, she was still in need of someone to come and to help her with her apartment, uh, and uh she was looking for cleaning supplies. Her apartment had been flooded, and she was uh, in town. Uh, I drove uh, down there and arrived like at a moment in time, right? Say 11.53. At 11.54, she came walking down the sidewalk, right? And uh, I had in my car cleaning supplies, buckets, brushes, sponges, those kind of things. And uh, she walked up and she said, I'm looking for cleaning supplies to clean my apartment. Um, and I said, come with me. Yeah. It was like that, you know, it was just that. And uh, isn't that amazing? Like, you know, how can God like orchestrate those kinds of things? Now, if you asked me when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, uh, you know, it was the era sort of a... a, a the pursuit of glamour, the pursuit of things, right? It was, uh, it was kind of that the area. If you'd ask me what the stuff of life was about, uh, I would have said to you, uh, well, it, it's uh, absolutely, if you're measuring it, well, it's absolutely measured in the abundance of things, right? That's what life is about. It's about that kind of pursuit. Uh, it's about, uh, you know, get all you can, can all you get, and sit on the can. That was kind of the era I grew up in. That's what life was about. Did you catch all that? Your, your neighbor will help you. It was the conceive it, believe it, achieve it generation, right? And whatever you had, you could, you could, if you could conceive it and believe it, man, you could achieve it. You could have whatever you want. I don't know if that's true, uh, you know. So I didn't learn to depend on me and not the Lord. That was the message that came through loud and clear to me. If you're going to have, you depend on yourself. And so I did. And so I pursued that. And then I, over time, you know, I've learned, I gained a little wisdom. And I realized that what I actually need, maybe just, uh, is not what I thought I needed. But, uh, yeah, it was that kind of generation, that kind of time, that kind of thinking. You know, as I've grown in Christ... And over the last several weeks, we've been uh, learning what does it mean, what does it really mean to follow Christ? What does that mean, like in the day-to-day, -day, the ongoing? Not what did it mean for his disciples. Yes, we wanted to learn that. But what does it mean for us in this day to be a disciple or a follower or a learner of the way of Jesus? What does it really mean to learn it and to live it out? And so we've been spending time in the scripture together, you know, kind of, Imagining ourselves sometimes as part of the crowd that Jesus was teaching to uh, and speaking to. Uh, and sometimes imagining ourselves as part of the inner circle of Jesus' disciples where we were sitting at the table with him and listening. Uh, what did he say? Or what did he do? What does he mean for us to do? And we've been asking that question for uh, the last few weeks together. Well, in Luke chapter 12... Uh, it's a time when there's a large crowd that has gathered, as Luke records it, and there are many people there. It says they were kind of trampling each other. You ever been to uh, 
like a football game of 50, 60,000 people, been in one of those crowds where it's just you just feel the weight of the crowd around you and people are just pressing in. Uh, think of that kind of group of people or that kind of crowd that uh, Jesus has gathered around him uh, in the midst of this teaching. And um, so someone from the crowd, uh, we're going to look at uh, the passage of Scripture from Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 21, at least those two verses and maybe some others. Uh, someone in the crowd, if you want to read there along with me, uh, Luke 12, verse 13 and following. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? And then he said to them, that is the crowd, Watch out! Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. That's a powerful thought. This is how it will be for those who store up their barns with self, one translation says, and not with God. Life does not consist in the abundance of things, Jesus said. Life does not consist in the abundance of things. Well, again, if you'd asked me when I was a teenager growing up, I would have said it most certainly does. It most certainly does. Well, the New King James, I love how it says that for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. We read past that really quickly because in America today, and I don't know that this has changed a whole lot, there's still sort of that underlying message in the economy that is supported by the getting and the possessing of things, right? There has to be that. Do you, ever, do you, all, what, do you all ever see uh, like advertisements for things? You know, the stuff that you need that you didn't know you needed? But now that you've watched the commercial, you're sure you do need that. And so you go and buy it, right? Um, it's even, advertising is taking a whole new turn in our world today. And, you know, it's not just like TV ads. It's ads that appear on your screen, uh, you know, in your social media, right? It's like the, that <coughs> thing that you didn't, you, you have a watch, but you don't have this watch. The one that's on the screen. You don't have the better version of the watch that you have. This watch is, you know, a really basic watch. I'll tell you, it is. But, you know, I, there are watches that I see that I'm, I can covet things, right? There's that in me. There's this thing in me. And so I have to realize that I am being invited by companies to purchase their product. And that my life will be better once I have them. So they say. And so, sometimes I click buy now. Isn't it just so easy to add to our list of possessions? Buy now. Because you're already set up to buy now. That's just our world. And then you feel some uh, buyer's regret or remorse once you click that button. Life is not defined by what you have, even when you have a lot. The message says that same thought in a little bit different way. Life is not defined by what you have, even when you have a lot. Does anyone here know people who sort of define themselves by the, the things they have? And maybe you've been there, maybe you've done it. And that, you know, that's just honest where you are. Uh, life is not measured by how much you own. The New Living Translation says that a little bit differently. So we hear these words of Jesus and they, they're sort of 
just in, in different words, it all says the same thing. See, Jesus is teaching us, and, and he is, and he has been teaching, that there are two kingdoms in the world, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, that is, and the kingdom of this world. You say, well, what are the difference? Well, Jesus has been teaching this, and so the context of our passage today is that the man who speaks up out of the crowd and asks Jesus to do something for him, and sometimes rabbis were known for settling disputes among people, I should say it that way, uh, but among the, the Jewish culture, uh, the elder son would have normally gotten a double portion of the inheritance. That's just the way it was. And so the younger son um, would not have expected to get anything more than, you know, a lesser portion. He would not have been entitled to anything more than what he had already received. But he says to Jesus, the rabbi, and sometimes, you know, Pastors and people in positions of, uh, you know, sort of become referees. And so Jesus, who, Jesus said, appointed me a referee or an umpire or an arbiter between you two. And so Jesus speaks into this by illustrating it with this parable. Jesus has been teaching about the kingdoms of this world and the kingdom of God. And you'll notice the difference between two kingdoms. The kingdom of this world, the kingdom of God, on the one hand, the kingdom of this world is about getting, and the kingdom of God is about giving. And you'll see that as Jesus teaches, if you follow his teachings at all, you'll see that the primary emphasis of Jesus is on giving, and this world's message is about getting. You'll also see this kingdom, the kingdom of the world is about having, and the kingdom of the, uh, of heaven, the kingdom of God, is about helping. It's about looking to the needs, not just of yourself, but also to the needs of others. The kingdom of this world is an <coughs> external-based kingdom, and the kingdom of God is more of an internal. Jesus said one time about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is not here or there, though the kingdom of God is within you, right? It's an internal kingdom and not an external kingdom that's set up with kings and palaces and material things, which is, leads me to the kingdom of this world is very much a material kingdom, and the kingdom of God is very much a spiritual kingdom. Does that make sense to you? Does that help you understand the difference? And so when Jesus came, his teachings weren't that popular for a lot of reasons. And we still struggle with that because the world tells us the world tells us life is about getting and having. It's about the things that you can see. It's about the material things that you can possess. And Jesus is over here saying, no, there's more to life than that. In this kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, actually, real life is about giving. It's more blessed to, Jesus said what? It's more blessed to give than to receive. <coughs> and some of you already started your Christmas getting list. It's all right. I like getting gifts at Christmas too. Um, but it's about helping. Well, so, and when the man speaks, and Jesus is like, have you not heard what I said? Like, and so he, he speaks to the man's ask of him, that is, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus said, yeah, I'm, uh, that's not my job. Uh, but then he says this really important thing. Life does not consist in the abundance of the things you possess, so watch out. This is like, um, you know there are just uh, animals in the world that will devour you? Like they will just eat you up? Uh, there were seven German shepherd dogs on Robert Pruitt's porch that I rode my bicycle by his house occasionally. And if they were asleep, that was fine. But if they were out in the yard... You didn't ride by. You had to watch out against those dogs or they would eat you up. Be on your guard against. So if you, Jesus is saying, watch out. Be on your guard against. He's saying that because, remember, he's for us and he wants us to learn a way of life that is helpful to us. 
And so Jesus tells this story, and I want to hold on to that verse for just a minute. He tells this parable about a certain man whose farm or ground produced a good crop, and he had more than he needed. And so he said, here's what I'll do. I'll tear down the barns I currently have and build bigger ones for myself so that I will have more than enough or enough for all of my life. I will store all, here's a word, I will store all my grains and my goods. What you have is not yours. You're just getting to borrow it. I'm just getting to borrow it for a little while. Right? I don't own anything. I don't possess anything. I'm just getting to use it for a little while. And Jesus says in this story, God says to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Listen, you're not in control of even your very life. And then who's going to get all these things that you have prepared for you, for yourself? And this is how it will be for anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. Who does not acknowledge that there is another kingdom with greater good. That there is another way of life that we are to entertain or that we are to participate in. And that we are invited to participate in so that we may live at peace. The stuff of life. I think all of us have had questions recently. What is life really about? And I don't think the, you know, uh, the timing of this thought is, is you know, it is perfectly actually because as we think about in the context of a situation where many people have, have lost most if not all their earthly possessions as I've driven around and as I was down in Old Fort, it becomes very evident, right, that the things that we possess, if, if our lives are defined by the things that we possess and work for and accumulated, and all that's been given to us to enjoy and to make our life easier, lost, or ruined, if that's gone, then what is life? What is life? And that's hard for us to wrap our head around. We've all been jarred awake to the reality of how fragile life is and the things that we hold dear can be. So Jesus said, watch out. And be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Don't, don't let... Uh, what is greed anyway? Well, it, you know, it's... If, I don't think did I put that on there? I sure hope I did because I didn't. But you know, if I were defining greed, did I put that there? Don't you hate it when it's not there? <laughs> yeah, I had it there in my head. Do you ever have things there in your head? What is greed? Watch out for greed. This consuming desire to have more. Someone said uh, greed offers satisfaction but never satisfies. I don't know who said that, but I like it. Greed offers satisfaction, but never actually satisfies. So don't fall into that trap. Watch out. Be on your guard. If you <coughs> make life about the getting, the having, the hoarding of goods for yourself, you're going to miss out on the greater good that God has for you in this world to participate in and to experience, not just for yourself, some of the greatest pleasures. We talked about this on Wednesday night recently. Uh, and some of the greatest things that we have experienced these recent days are, have been the ability uh, to give and receive from our neighbors. Maybe life isn't about possessions, but it's about the people next door. It's about the people down the road. It's about the people that we can give out of our abundance to, even if it's we have two and Someone has none, and we divide our two, and they have one, and we have one. And there's this joy and this uh, glory that God receives when our uh, hands are open and our hearts are open to the people next door to us. Watch out and be on your guard against the getting and the having the hoarding mentality. And so in verse 22, if you, I don't have it on the screen, but if Jesus... Actually, I might have it. Look at that. Look at that. I do have it on the screen. See there? Sometimes I think I have it, and I do. 
Then Jesus said to his disciples, not just to the crowd, but he said, <coughs> the, the disciples are standing close to him, and he, he looks at them who are very up near to him, and he said, therefore, this is how it is for people who are not rich toward God, whose hearts are not given toward him. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, about your body, what you will wear. For life is, read this with me, for life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Now, we all know what it means to have food and clothing. And we've some of us have needed that recently, and we have helped others have that recently. And we're going to have to keep doing that for a long time. So we know that life is, those are needful things, but life is about more than those things. Does that make sense? It's not that those things are bad, but life, real life, is about more than things. And that's important for us as followers of Jesus to latch on to because if we don't watch out, if we don't guard ourselves, we will make it about the food and the clothes. And we're not content to be filled <laughs> until we're hungry again, right? If we're not careful. The body is more than, more than food, more than clothes. Verse 29, in that same conversation, in that same gathering, Jesus is still talking to his disciples. He says, and do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink and do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things and your father knows you need them but seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well. <clears throat> we have experienced the giving of God to us in our moments of need recently. I have. You have. We have experienced the giving of God to us. And Jesus said, don't set your heart on those things. Instead, Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. And then you will have treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So for Jesus' followers and for his disciples, he's over and over again saying, no, I want you to live in a kingdom that is of the heart and not a kingdom that is just of this world, a kingdom that's internal and not just external, a kingdom that's not based on just material goods, but on spiritual treasures where your heart will be also. John Ortberg tells the story of his grandmother and he uh, and himself as he was growing up used to play Monopoly. Anybody ever play Monopoly in here? <clears throat> Anybody ever get in family feuds over Monopoly? <laughs> We do. We did. Time or two. <clears throat> um, I hope you're speaking to your family again. If the Monopoly game has separated you, you really need to fix that. <laughs> but Monopoly is one of those games that teaches that life is about the getting and the having and the hoarding of goods, right? And properties and money. And so John Orberg tells a story of how he used to play that with his grandmother and he was not easy on his grandmother. I mean, like, she was older, but he was about winning the game. And he did. And she would say things to him, like, and she did say to him, and he actually wrote a book. Johnny, just remember, when the game's over, it all goes back in the box. <laughs> he, he had his pile over here on this side of the table, right? And she had, like, nothing. Like, like maybe a train station, you know? She had nothing. And he said, you know, I thought about that a lot. When the game's over, it all goes back in the box. Jean Moffat, one of our dear ladies many years ago, who was a member of our church, and I treasured her and her conversations. And one afternoon I spent with her uh, just talking about life and her journey. And she said, you know, my dad was a, a tomato farmer. And he farmed between Henderson County and Florida. It was kind of our way of life there for a period of time, especially as I was young and growing up. And I remembered one year, um, I remember one year when I was really little, 
the tomatoes were just ripe on the vine. The, the vines were so full. And I would go to my, with my dad to the fields often and just watch how the tomatoes were growing. And she said, uh, there came a rain and it rained and it rained and it rained. And the fields flooded and flooded and flooded. All of our tomatoes, all of our fields were flooded. And she said, I remember going and standing at the edge of the field with my dad. And she said, he was an old farmer, hard kind of guy, you know. And she said, I didn't see, I never saw much emotion really in him. But that particular day, there were tears. I looked up and there were tears running down his face. And she said, I put my hand up and took his hand. I was standing there in my little rain boots and I said, Daddy, what are we going to do? And she said, I never forgot what he said to me. He looked down and he said, well, Jeannie, we'll just start over again next year. And she said, as a child and as a young woman who grew up and went through some pretty hard times, I never forgot my dad's words when times got hard. Well, Jeannie, we'll just start over again next year. Sometimes we will. We will lose our possessions. We will lose the things that are promised and that seem to be on the doorstep for us. And many have. But when we lose our possessions, it's important for you and I as followers of Christ and people who live in the kingdom of God. To know that you may lose your possessions, but you cannot lose your provider. You cannot. In this world, we live in a kingdom of this world, but also for those who are in Christ, we live in a kingdom of heaven where God is our father and provider and he is able to do more than we can think or ask or imagine. The stuff of life, the stuff of life isn't isn't stuff. When the game's over, it all goes back in the box. And my father says to you, and as you and I come alongside our dear friends and our neighbors next door and in the county next door, we need to be able to look them in the eyes and with confidence say, my father says you can start over. And I'll be with you. Let's pray. God, you speak so powerfully through our Savior, Jesus, about life. The messages of the world are powerful, and we can lose sight of what life is truly about. The knowing of you, the walking with you, the transformation that you bring to our life and perspective. And who we are is not what we own. but whose we are and who owns and holds us in his hands. And so help us to feel and to know and experience the comfort and power of your spirit in our lives, reassuring us in these unstable times that you're a God who never changes. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And those famous and amazing and awesome deeds that you did in the past for others where the oil didn't run out, the jar was never empty, you can still do for us today. Help us to walk in the confidence and to give glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we close our time of worship. God may have laid upon your heart to pray for a specific person or need, or maybe just yourself. You said, you know what, I've lived in the kingdom of this world long enough and I'd like to live under King Jesus for the rest of my life and to live in that peace and that confidence that only he can give. And I'd like you to pray for me about doing just that. As we stand and as we sing, Pastor Gray and I will be at the front. You may want to just leave a prayer on the tree or however you'd like to do that. 
we'd be happy to pray with you and encourage you. Let's stand together. today. Sing it tomorrow. Sing it on your way to work. Sing it throughout the week. And let it be a reminder of this time of worship. As life creeps in and uh, as distractions come, keep that focus on the joy of knowing Him and experiencing Him as your Lord, your Savior, your provider, and the one who can Give that confidence away to others. Invite them to know what life is, what truly life is. <clears throat> Look forward to seeing you uh, later in the week on Wednesday. You know, some have asked, how can we help? Uh, <coughs> two ways. One, uh, you know, our neighbors. How can we help our neighbors? How can we help folks down the road? How can we help folks uh, near us? Um, a couple of ways. One, you can continue to give. So if you have given and you are giving to our church benevolence and local missions fund, you're giving. Thank you. You can also go. You can connect with our North Carolina Baptist Missions 
uh, groups that are going out and serving in our community. There are jobs that are continuously being assigned. You can connect with someone at First Baptist or Mud Creek where our uh, uh, center hubs are for North Carolina Baptist in our area. Mm -hmm. um, so you can give or you can go out and serve. But go through them. They can coordinate and help you get connected with where and how to serve best. Um, they, they're doing that well. Uh, let your neighbors know that they can still ask for help through those resources. Um, please encourage them to know that. Um, so we want to help our neighbors and our friends uh, and be God's hands and feet to them. Um, so thank you for doing that. Uh, as you go throughout this week, we're going to do something fun just for our children and our community, inviting them, as Grace said at the beginning, trunk or treat. Um, participate in that, bring joy to our children and our community as well. Um, Pastor Gray, any final words? Would you pray for us as we close? Thank yeah. you so much. Just a reminder, if you're a student or a parent of students, we're meeting immediately following this, or, you know, a couple minutes after the fellowship hall. Uh, so, let's pray. Lord, you're good. Uh, we thank you that you are our enjoyment. You, you are our prize. I pray that uh, we will be able to come to the end of stuff. We'd be able to come to the end of um, satisfying us and get to the point of pursuing you with all that we are and all that we have. Lord, I pray for our church. I pray for everybody in this room right now <clears throat> and those who are not able to be with us, that you would just be able to be our portion this week and our portion to share with others. It's in your son's victorious in my name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, just for a quick minute, you know, somebody, uh, a little bird told me that it's Brecklin Kirkpatrick's birthday. She's out there somewhere. Where is she? We should sing to her. She's in the kitchen. Bracklin Kirkpatrick. Brecklin. Come right there. Bracklin. I see her. Happy birthday to you.